Thanks, Rafael. So as we look at cloud, um, everybody here understands that it's a great opportunity. You uh, had a chance to hear from uh, the keynote this morning about the value that cloud brings in and how the cloud strategy is tied to your data strategy, et cetera. So it gives you the, uh, the flexibility, the scale, and the time to market that you need. But you also need to balance that with appropriate uh, governance and security, uh, which is a challenge that everybody's facing today, all of, almost all of our customers here. Um, so what this requires is striking this right balance of the business needs of agility with the democratization of the data access while not getting into trouble with your regulators or your auditors. So let's see how we can do that in a hybrid multi-cloud uh, types of environments. So what this also means is that you need to pay special resident, uh, any um, attention to residency, uh, regulatory requirements, as well as uh, trying to balance that out with the speed with which you want to innovate in your business. So overall, it's a journey, and everybody goes at it at different paces. Um, we will show you some of the exciting tech that we have now, uh, both with our data plane services, as well as all of the uh, 10 plus years worth of uh, open source investments that we have in the community and the, uh, how the community has come together to give us all of these wonderful components that we can now uh, use to manage, secure, and govern data holistically across multiple data lakes, um, whether they are on-prem or in the cloud or both. Um, so we'll look at how these investments have helped us leverage these open source uh, technologies to build into, uh, build upon our HDP and HDF stack and to have this data plane umbrella on top that will help you stitch all this together. Okay? So let's uh, maybe look at this uh, scenario. So uh, to put this in context and perspective, uh, we always look at this, our favorite bank, uh, Hortonia Bank, uh, uh, appropriately named here. They are an on-prem customer. They have uh, a lot of data sitting in multiple data centers here. You can see that they have uh, data centers worldwide in Dublin, San Francisco, Prague, et cetera. And uh, what they want to be able to do is expand into uh, AWS, Google, Azure, uh, et cetera, and then be able to have this fabric where they can get this virtualized view. So they want to have the illusion that all of this data is sitting in a single logical data lake and be able to understand all of that data, all aspects of it. So what this means is that they want to be able to use this across the enterprise consistently and also be able to um, have this uh, repository of trustworthy data. So once you have uh, the visibility into this data, then you want to be able to take some pointed action so you can get the business value out of these investments uh, that you have in there. And this requires you to pay attention not only to how you're going to scale this uh, infrastructure, but also how you do this responsibly with the right metadata security, regardless of where this data is ideally located. So let's see how um, we can do this. So the full uh, data life cycle here is going to span everything from how do you discover where your data is, how do you annotate, organize, curate this data, and how do you take action on it further down the line once you've organized it and you're able to find this easily and quickly for different purposes. So um, in the case of Hortonia Bank, let's look at how they're able to uh, do this and how they're able to leverage the existing technologies that we have in terms of the data plane services to be able to further um, this effect. So, uh, the idea here is being to combine the data, uh, the, uh, the data center with the cloud to give you this data gravity that they need and to extract the right business value out of that. So rather than keep this abstract, let's look at how um, Hortonia is going to do this through the eyes of three of these personas. So there is uh, Michelle, who works out of the Data Protection Officer organization, which is now mandated by GDPR, as most of you would know. And she wants to be able to organize, curate, and classify this data, make it easy to find. John is an infrastructure admin who needs to replicate this data. So he wants to move the data between these environments, both on-prem and cloud and multi-cloud. Uh, Ivana is an analyst who's sitting, uh, data scientist who's sitting within the um, different groups in there. And then she wants to be able to use tools like uh, Hive and Spark and be able to uh, provide the right business value on top by building models, et cetera. So let's see how uh, all of these three personas are going to benefit from having uh, the centralized fabric. So uh, looking at data plane service, uh, we're going to see this, how each of these personas interacts with this environment and are able to further uh, Hortonia Bank's journey to the cloud. 
So DPS, as we mentioned before, builds on the, all of the innovations in the Apache communities, and it brings all of these things together under the same umbrella, so you can leverage the power of this entire ecosystem, mm -hmm. and giving a, a set of open source components for data management. This includes like, you know, your favorite Apache Hive, SQL warehousing, Spark for in-memory, Zeppelin for notebooking, data science, along with all of the security and governance investments we have made in terms of Apache Ranger, Apache um, Atlas, Apache Knox, et cetera. So we'll see how all of this comes together. All right, so let's uh, first look at this through the lens of the Data Steward Studio, which will help you find, organize, and curate these assets. So Ram, can you show us how Michelle can uh, start this journey by locating the data that she cares about? Sure. So, okay, the screen's up there. So what you're seeing is the new data plane UI. So We've already pre-registered all of these uh, data lakes. So in this hybrid environment, I have three data lakes. One is in Prague, one in Frankfurt, and the other in Dublin. I'm going to switch to this uh, Data Steward Studio experience, which is tailored for a steward persona. So straight off the bat, you can see that this has a view of all the data lakes, not from an infrastructure standpoint, but from a data management standpoint. Right? So there's, there's individual dashboards for each of these different data lakes. So for example, if I go into the Frankfurt dashboard, that shows you, eventually once it paints, right, it shows you a summary of all the assets that are there. OK, there you go. Uh, in this case, we profiled all the assets in this, in this particular data lake. And you have some metrics around recently used assets and things of that nature. So this is the starting point for the data steward to understand what's in the data lake. So we notice that there's a widget up here on the top right where it refers to sensitive data and non-sensitive yep. data. How is that done? So sensitive data profiling is, is essentially one profiler that's part of Data Steward Studio. So inside Data Steward Studio, one of the services that we have is um, a fairly scalable data profiling framework. So we have a set of out-of-the-box profilers, and there's also other third-party profilers that can be added over time. So one of the profilers in here is this sensitive data profiler, which is looking for specific patterns in the code, in, in the data using machine learning techniques to essentially identify sensitive data and then curate that and present it to the data steward. So the idea is we want the steward to use a recommendation-like system for them to identify data that needs to be curated and handled appropriately. Great. Okay. So what else can you do with uh, Data Steward Studio? So one of the central things that we want to enable is a, is a curated experience for data. Right? So as, as Michelle, the data steward, wants to put together data sets for data scientists to, to, to discover and explore, they can actually use this fundamental building block called an asset collection. So in this case, it's a bank. So imagine that you, ha you might have um, a customer data set that you're interested in. And this could include both structured data, i.e. hive tables and things of that nature but also include semi-structured data. So for example, you might have loan documents for that customer, which are PDF documents. So you could curate and assemble these documents uh, on these data sets, essentially then to, to provide to your consumers a, a, an organized view of their data. Right? So some of the things that you could do in there, we, we jokingly refer to this as, this is the Facebook page for your data assets. So there's a collaboration experience that's, that's built right into this, uh, into Data Studio. So as users start using these data sets, they can annotate them, they can flag them, and this can help people actually discover which data sets are more relevant for their use cases than others. What other types of profilers do we have in Data Steward Studio? Sorry? What other types of profilers do we have? Oh, so we have profilers that essentially uh, surface up a lot of the Hive metadata. For example, if I click on one of the assets in this customer table is this US customers data set, right? So I can look at the schema. Uh, not only can I just get a structural view of the data, but I can also, for example, visualize some distributions of the data. For example, let's say people by weight. Right? So some univariate statistics, for example, are actually profiled and summarized here. So you can quickly browse the data to get a measure of what's in the data set from a quality or a risk standpoint. So you can start doing those sorts of ad hoc profile measurements through the data. Yeah. Data governance happens to be a team sport in most of these organizations. Yep. So is there any kind of workflow or other tooling that's available within the space? Yes, so from a data governance standpoint, one of the things that's included in here, we, we touched upon this sensitive data profiler, right? So what that does for you is identifies potentially columns that, ha that contain sensitive data. So for example, if I look at this table here, you can see that there are some tags which are annotated in different colors. 
So the, the magenta color refers to the social security number or a telephone column or an email address column. So these are potentially sensitive assets, right? So as a steward, I can go in and I can accept, there's a, there's a little tag editing workflow to, to essentially accept these recommendations, at which point those columns actually are going to carry that tagging with them and you can build additional security policies yep. around them as to how that data is going to be administered. Is there a way to visualize how the data is secured? Absolutely, yeah. So this, the policy tab here shows you all the range of policies for this asset. And similarly, there's also a notion of Atlas lineage that's also surfaced up here. So for example, you can see for this asset, uh, this is the, the flow that was used to actually create this particular asset. All this information is coming straight from Atlas. So one of the things that I'm showing you here is I'm showing you some Hive metadata, some Atlas lineage, some Ranger policy, some audit information. These are all data that are coming from different facets of the data, from different Apache projects. So instead of having a steward go to five different UIs and tools to get this information, this is a single pane of glass that lets you get all of this information in a single screen. So that's one of the powers of what this approach enables for the steward. So in Hortonia Bank's case, all of this data is lying on-prem. So how would they move this data into the cloud? How would they get this data to the place where they want to run this analysis? Good, good question. So, so once all of this data is curated and organized, the next step is for you to make this data set available to someone who wants to consume it, like a data scientist, right? So this is where another service that's part of data plane comes into the picture. So for this demo, I'm just switching to another environment where just so I don't get confused, I have two very simple environments. One is called on-prem DLM, the other is called on-cloud DLM. So let me go up here and switch to the Data Lifecycle Manager UI. I'm not going to go through all of this, but essentially what I'm doing here is you can set up pairing relationships between data lakes, right? So for example, here I have a pairing relationship between the on-prem on cluster and a cloud cluster. Once you have a pair, established like this, now you can set up replication policies. For example, here's a policy that says, I'm going to replicate HDFS data from this on-prem data lake directly into this S3 bucket, right? And there's also services for essentially replicating Hive data. And it's not just the data, it's both the data as well as the metadata and the security policies. So as a, as a steward, you can administer your data set in one place, and then you can have this data set actually show up in the cloud with all of the controls that you have actually set up. I see. So essentially, you're replicating the context of usage of the data exactly. along with the data, which is different from what a lot of the other vendors do in terms of replication. And all of this is based off of our open source investments and technologies. That's so correct. you saw in brief how we, you know, we are enabling, um, the, through Data Studio, Studio and Data Lifecycle Manager, the ability to inspect your data, understand your data better, and yep. move it to the right place uh, in terms of a cloud context. That's so, correct. Uh, do you have other uh, you know, tooling that will help you spin up these environments or provision these environments? Absolutely. So I think that uh, you know, when we look at how you would actually create a cloud data lake in the first place, so this is where CloudBreak comes in. And I'm showing you this is uh, CloudBreak 2.7 that just went GA last week. So one of the new capabilities in CloudBreak is this notion of a data lake. One of the blueprints that we have here is, oh, one moment. Oh, there, we went a whole 20 minutes without something happening to me. All right. So it looks like my VPN connection was dropped. OK, so one of the new uh, blueprint types is this data-like uh, blueprint. So you can use that to set up a, a data lake. And once you have a data lake, that can be the target of a replication endpoint. So you can replicate data from your on-prem data lake to this cloud data lake. And once you have that defined, then through CloudBreak, you can define ephemeral workloads. So for example, here I have a high LLAP workload that's using the same data lake. So essentially what this means is you'll have the same security policies applicable both on-prem and in the cloud through CloudBreak. So what we are saying here is we can now locate the data, identify the ones, organize the ones that you care about, provision an environment in the cloud, and move the data over all through the data plane service. Exactly. That's pretty awesome. Cool. So uh, hopefully we've uh, given you a glimpse into how um, we can help enterprises who are doing their journey into the cloud 
to responsibly move the data without, you know, without any kind of reservation around, um, being able to sacrifice security or governance kind of capabilities as you move into the cloud and complement that and enhance that with what all of the services that we have, all based on open source technologies. Back to Raphael. Thank you. All right.